In this video, you're going to see the recording of me going live with Peter Crone on Instagram. And for those of you who don't know, Peter is known as the mind architect. What he is really great at, and you'll see it in the very first few minutes of the interview when he's listening to the way that I'm speaking, he's really great at listening. He is really great at being able to identify the mental constructs that keep someone trapped in their prison. And Financial Times has described meeting Peter like meeting Buddha, Austin Powers, and Einstein at the same time. He really brings his Einstein and his Buddha through the concepts that he breaks down, but he does it in a humorous, joyful way. So I'm really excited for you to watch the interview, so enjoy. One of the things that you've shared in the mastermind, right, and um, in one of our one-on-one -on -one coaching calls is yeah. you were going to suffer if you believe the way that things are shouldn't be the way that they are. Right. And I'd really love for you to expand on that quote and um, help anyone to surrender to the way that life is unfolding. Yeah, it's a big one. And of course it applies to anything outside of relationships too, really. So it's sort of speaking to the fundamental conditioning of a human being, which is we're primarily wired to survive and the way that our brains anticipate our interpretation of survival usually isn't the way things are. So we're under the impression that if things aren't the way we want them, then we're not gonna be okay, which of course is a lie and it's also exhausting. So, you know, surrender is a strong word and it's a powerful word. I, I do invite people to consider that sometimes people misunderstand surrender or acceptance as though it's sort of resignation, like, oh, well, they broke up with me or, oh, well, I got fired. and that can lead to obviously a lot of cynicism and hopelessness. So it's, it's a tricky balance between accepting life as it is while still remaining committed to what it is you want to create. So in the two yeah. scenarios you gave me of someone who's single, they're resisting it, they don't want to be single or somebody who's in a relationship and they don't want to be in that relationship. You know, I think the person who, the latter, someone in a relationship and they know that it's not right for them, it's a quote unquote easier situation to be because you can make a choice to move on, right? To hopefully be respectful and honest of your partner um, and say that, you know, for whatever reasons, like I feel that this doesn't work for me. For somebody who's single, obviously it's a lot harder to fabricate a uh, <laughs> relationship. It's not like you're gonna go grocery shopping and you know that you can do that today. It's like, you know, I'm gonna go to Whole Foods and then I'm gonna fall in love and get married, <laughs> which might happen at Whole Foods, but, or wherever you shop. Um, so I think for both cases, there's an opportunity to find peace, which is the absence of resistance, um, but also that really profound harmony with the way things are right now. And perhaps even more profoundly, the way that you are relative to circumstances right now. Meaning like so many people stay in relationships when they know they're not happy, they're not healthy, perhaps worst case scenario, they're being abused and they don't want to be. So sometimes their opportunity is to actually honor what's true for them and to actually speak up. And that can be difficult for people, you know, especially if there's children involved. So I hope that answers the question. So yeah, life is the way nice. it is. And, nice. um, we don't need to be resigned to it, but we want to honor it so we're not fighting it constantly and then remain committed moving forward to what kind of life we want to create. Love that. And, and it can also show up in the normal day-to-day -day life. Like for example, yesterday I was in traffic and I wanted to be somewhere at 6 p.m. And I yeah. realized that I was going to be late because it was just it took like yeah. 20 minutes to get to a certain place. Yeah. And I asked myself a question, which came from just your teachings in the mastermind and podcast and so on. And I asked myself, can life be any different than the way it is right now? Yeah. And of course the answer was no. And yeah. instantly I noticed my nervous system relaxing just yeah. by, um, you know, you mentioned like releasing the resistance to what is. Yeah. And feel like it's a, it's a powerful question that people can ask themselves. Are there any other questions or any other reminders that someone can remind themselves of to really allow themselves to release that resistance? Uh, well, I think maybe in the way that I'm gonna explain what you said, which will be a powerful takeaway for you, my friend, as much work as you've done. So that's beautiful that you asked your question, you know, could life be any different than the way it is? No, right? So that's what gave you this, the form of relief. But you just said something that's an interesting and powerful distinction that I'm happy to share here. You said, I'm gonna be late. Mm. Now, everybody understands what that means, I'm gonna be late. But I want people to really hear what I'm about to say. You're never late. <laughs> 
because you can't be anywhere other than where you are. Now, the difference is, do you honor what you said, right? Mm. So you might, you're never late relative to the universe and the moving of everything in the, in the realm of duality and cause and effect. You can't be other where than where you are. However, did you do what you said you'd do by when you said you'd do it? Now, in that case, you're in your car, and I'm assuming knowing you, you will uh, have called somebody or texted and said, hey, just wanted to let you know, I'm going to probably be there in another 10, 15, 20 minutes or whatever. Or you might have said, I'm going to be late. Um, so it's an interesting but subtle distinction, right? So he realized that we, we've all said it. I've said it. You know, I'm going to be late. But when I really understood the mechanics of time and space and how it relates to the human experience and this construct of being on planet Earth, you literally can't be anywhere other than where you are at the time that you're there. For that reason, you're never late relative to the real quantum field. You're precisely where you're meant to be. The difference is, can you collapse your motion with what you said? And that's mm -hmm. where the power comes in. So that's a... That, I didn't expect to give a, a free, powerful, <laughs> well, I give a lot of free shit for free, but that, that's a powerful <laughs> one for people to understand. It's like, you're never late. You're always exactly where you are at the time that you're there. Does it, however, like correlate to the words that you used? That's powerful. Wow. That is very powerful. You know, one thing, one thing that you uh, are really great at, and I share this with my girlfriend after our one-on-one -on -one session, just yeah. your ability to listen and like hear what I'm saying and also just seeing you coach other people, but also hear what's being said and what the words are revealing about someone's paradigm, right? Yeah, exactly. And I asked you, I remember on our call, I asked, I was like, how, how do you do that? And then you share that it's not about, you're not doing anything. It's more about like the, the absence of what you're, you're doing. Yeah. Right? So can you, because, you know, a lot of people here are either wanting to get into a relationship or they're in a relationship. And a big part of communication is listening. Yes. So can you share um, a little bit about how it's not about what you're doing when listening, yeah. but it's more about what you're not doing? Yes. So listening, obviously, it relates to every arena of life, like to relate to life, whether it's relationships, your profession, your own thought processes, just people on the street. So most people, let me put it this way. Most people can't listen. <laughs> because they're designed currently to survive. So if your mind is currently conditioned in a way that the, pro the prerogative is to survive, then you can't fully be with the person you're with or the circumstance, because it's like your brain has got these antennas out where you're looking out for any potential threat, right? Are they gonna say something that's offensive? Did I say something that's gonna upset them? Is there any kind of bad news coming? And so when the brain is in, a, in that state of self-preservation, the ability to just drop your own survival instincts and truly be with someone can't happen. It's too vulnerable. So when I saw that and I realized I didn't have anything to survive, then sort of like the me got pushed to one side, integrated, and I wasn't concerned about me anymore and I was able to be with the other person's reality, which to me is the greatest gift you can give anyone. Most people's listening is filtered through how does what they're saying impact me, either something I'm gonna be a beneficiary of, or how is what they're gonna say potentially offensive to me, or it will trigger my own insecurities or inadequacies. And that, that listening is it's conditional. Right. And that's why most relationships aren't founded in real love. They're based in this sort of conditional love. Right. If you act a certain way, then I'll stick around. If you don't, then I'm out, you know. And uh, so that's where listening, the power of listening. It, it's weird. And, you know, a lot of my things that I speak about are sort of Zen Cohen's. But listening happens naturally in the absence of the you that's trying to survive. Wow. How about that for a line? <laughs> you put right there that's yeah. amazing yeah yeah so it doesn't matter if it's relationships professions your kids you know like i meant romantic relationships any kind of any kind of communication 
If you want to have powerful communications with people, the only way you can do that is by truly getting their reality. Now, also, the other thing is based on our deep seated beliefs, what we often hear is what we don't want to hear. It's like, let's just say for, you know, argument's sake, like a religion or politics right now. Like if somebody says, I'm a Democrat, and then someone says, I'm a Republican. Like you, you already have created this illusion of separation and division. And so the capacity to listen and get someone's reality is gonna be juxtaposed against what you already believe. And for that, for that reason, it's gonna probably be uh, dismissed. So you're not getting what they're saying. Well, it doesn't matter if you agree. Like I get to listen to anybody say anything and I just understand that's their reality. It doesn't have anything to say with me, do with me. Even if they're saying, dude, you're amazing. That obviously feels nice, but that's not necessarily a truth. That's their reality. Conversely, if somebody says, hey, you're an asshole. Like, again, doesn't do anything for me. That's their reality, <laughs> right? So you, you just start to see that everybody is living in their own world. And the degree to which you get that is the degree to which you can honor it. Doesn't mean you have to condone it, believe it, align with it. But that's just somebody's perspective. Mm, beautiful, brother. Yeah. One, one thing that you also shared that was confusing at me, for me at first, and then I really got it when you expanded on it. You shared this in the mastermind. I can't remember, uh, I won't say the name, but you shared that um, most people aren't in a relationship with another person. Yes. And, <laughs> so can I you remember it well. That was a powerful one. Yeah, I feel like that would be really powerful for a lot of people listening. Yeah, so to the same point, I mean, that, that woman in, the, in our group, in the mastermind, was like, so sweet, so kind, so loving, like everything that a partner would want. But what she realized through me coaching her was that she had always looked through the belief of her own form of inadequacy. In this case, it was around her intelligence, right? So she'd overheard something growing up and then that gave her the impression that perhaps she wasn't quote unquote smart enough, right? So that meant that every relationship she had, which is what everybody does, she was looking through the lens of her own inadequacy and then using compensation tactics, right? So if somebody feels inadequate, they might become a people pleaser, they might become a perfectionist. Maybe for a woman, you become a little bit more subservient or you become more nurturing, you do all the food, you do all the da da da, um, which is fine, you can do whatever you want, but if it's from the underlying construct of thinking that you are somehow fundamentally inadequate and not loved for who you are, then it is always a survival technique. And for that reason, she saw that she was not in a relationship with all her exes, <laughs> which was quite confronting, but she took it like a champ. Um, but rather she was in her relationship with her own view of herself, which is what most people have in relationships. They're not with the other person, they're with their view of the other person, which is really about themselves. And why I think it was so pivotal for the group and so powerful is because I'm sure you remember the next month, she actually said, she called all of her exes, <laughs> I don't know how many there are, three, five, 20, and said um, she just wanted to be responsible for the fact she realized she wasn't actually fully in a relationship with them. Not like a blame or judgment or criticism of herself, but just to be really powerful and um, responsible, which, holy shit, that's powerful. You know, so for people out there who are struggling in relationships, I promise you that one, at least one of the components of why the relationship isn't working is because you're looking through your own filter of self-preservation, inadequacy, insecurity, some belief of scarcity. And for that reason, your, your, your antennae are up there listening through that lens to see where those things get triggered and you're not fully with the person. None of this, by the way, is bad. This is human, right? Like there's no judgment, but if you want to have powerful relationships, then the only way to access that is by powerfully listening and being with other people. Mm, that's beautiful, brother. Um, this leads on to something that I feel like is going to come out of what you've just shared, which is, okay, well, so how do I do that? Or how do I, and yeah. one of the things I wrote down here because I feel like it's also really powerful as well, when it comes to how you work with people, you're not solving problems, you're dissolving problems. Yes. And all that you shared, sometimes asking for advice on how to solve a problem is perpetuating the false assumption that there's something wrong. Yes. And, and I feel like this can be helpful to people who want to, they go into a breakup and how do I stop feeling the pain or how do I, how, how do I have my partner give more attention to me? Like, so can you expand on how asking how to is general, generally perpetuating that there's something wrong in the first place. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I just love how articulate you've become or you are and maybe become more so from our work with language, right? So 
The how-to, I think there's two kind of prongs to how-to. There's how-to from the lens of curiosity. Like, I want to become a better partner. I want to become a better um, business partner, romantic partner, whatever it is. So that how-to is like, for myself, like, I want to know how to become a better athlete, a better tennis player, a better golfer. The difference is most people's how-to, like, is driven by the fear that something's wrong, <laughs> right? So, so first thing you have to understand is where is this how-to coming from? Like, what is the underlying intention? Is it survival-based? Like, how do I do this in order to, right? If it's got some sort of agenda to it, then you can pretty much rest assured that it's coming from a place of fear and subtle manipulation. Like, for me, when I can use myself, I'm happy to talk about myself. When I dated that girl way, way back, who I thought I was in love with, but which was really just the catalyst for my awakening, much of my house was like, how do I get it back, <laughs> right? But the how to get it back was absolutely 100% being driven by my own hurt, pain, and fear. So that never worked, thank God. Like, thank God it never did, because I would have never grown. I had to get on the other side of the how-to, which was really understanding that there's nothing missing, there's nothing wrong. And that's when the how-to dissipates. So the how-to this is predicated on the idea that there's something missing, you're hurt, and then you're looking for an external or this like, exogenous form of relief. Like, that will always fall on flat on its face. It's a vicious cycle. The how-to, which is about exploring your potential, is beautiful. Like, I'm all about that. Like, oh, how can I be a better lover? How can I be a better communicator? How can I be a better father? How can I be a better cook? How can I be whatever? Like, that's great. But just check in with yourself. Are you doing it in order to try and, like, attract acknowledgement, reverence, you know, um, some sort of acceptance from somebody else? Then it's a slippery slope that usually doesn't end well. <laughs> love that hopefully this is helping everyone watching live right now or if you're watching the replay and um the next yeah. thing that i really want to go through is so we've spoken about being able to surrender to the way that life is unfolding like in relation to time there's the now and then there's also our projection of the future right and one of the things that happens a lot when i'm working with clients is that there's a fear of what they're projecting to the future there's this the nature of life what you speak about uncertainty and one of the things that you've shared is that we're not scared of uncertainty. We're scared of what we're projecting into the future. Yeah. And your future is not full of anything bad other than what you're projecting into it. Yeah. And I feel like that was an amazing quote. I don't know where you share this. I have a whole note. I have a whole note uh, on my MacBook of just like everything that you've shared. And I feel like that was <laughs> that's like a, That's like an encyclopedia. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. So can you so, share? So, so that that distinction again is super powerful but because it's so commonplace and convincing and tempting to believe that what people are upset by is uncertainty like i'm scared of the unknown is a very common expression and it seems that way it really does seem that way but you're not <laughs> you, you can't be because if it's unknown then you can't be scared about it right I mean, I'll give people like, you know, half a percent of like just not knowing what's going to happen is for them a little bit of the contribution to feeling scared. But the thing that I want people to understand is what's creating the fear, the anxiety, the intrepidation or the trepidation, the, the panic, whatever it is, is because your brain is creating a superimposed idea of what might happen in the realm of uncertainty. Now that's very different because there you have some say, literally and figuratively, right? You're the one saying what you think is gonna happen, but for that reason, you can also undo it. So now you get to like actually recognize, wow, it's not the literal unknown that's upsetting me, it is what I am superimposing into it. Yes. And that's my own brain creating it. Beautiful, yeah. love that. And so that's the future, right? You just spoke about that. And then there's also people who may be holding on to the past for something that happened. I'll just share a quick little story. I mm -hmm. shared this um, when he came on a group call with some of my clients. I shared personally with you that when I first found you, I was navigating through a breakup. Mm -hmm. And it was a really challenging time of my life. And I remember hearing you first on a podcast. And I heard you say these, this quote that allowed me to find 
create total acceptance with the situation that I was holding on to. Mm -hmm. One of the famous quotes, like what happened happened, it couldn't have happened in, the, any, in any other way because it didn't. And I remember when I heard that, instantly my nervous system just relaxed. Yeah. So I'd love for you to expand on that because I feel like there are some people who may be listening who are in pain and yeah. they're wishing that they're, what happened in the past didn't happen and they're trying to fight reality and wish they could have went back into a time, went back in time and changed things. So mm -hmm. would you be open to um, expanding on that quote um, a little bit? For sure. Yeah, it's very powerful. And, and how it came through me is because it also helped me, right? Because I was dragging my history around with me in pain. And as a sort of recovering perfectionist at the time, there was this impression from the way that I was viewing life that I needed things to have been different in the way that I did it. Like I messed up this, I shouldn't have done that, that was bad, I could have done this. There was this whole conversation, this narrative around basically my history that I didn't like and hadn't accepted and how I thought or was wishing it had been different. And for a while there, like a lot of people, I really thought it could have been different. Oh, well, if I'd done this, I could have done it all. Like people really speak in that way, right? Like, oh, oh, we well, could have done that. Well, you should have done this. But you start to realize that's so moot because you couldn't have done anything different because it's done. <laughs> and when that hit me, like you said, the piece that I felt, the, the relief was like something I've never really had before because that weight is, it's energetic. The emotional component is real, right? Like it's not physical weight, but it is weight. And so I just like, it kind of came to me, it's like, well, what happened, happened. And well, it couldn't have been different, you know? So I sort of was playing with the words and I was like, it couldn't happen any other way because it didn't. And it was just so categoric, you know? So that for people right now who are struggling with anything from your history, I get it and I have compassion, but guilt, shame, uh, all of these things are just, you know, completely futile because you couldn't have done anything different. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. And I want to ask you one more question here and then I'd love to get any questions from people who are watching live right now. So if you have any questions, my ask is that you get ready for some questions because after I share this and Peter answers, we're going to take some questions here. Um, to help anyone who is watching live. So another question, another quote that you share uh, is Li life will present to you the people and circumstances to reveal where you're not yet free. Yeah. And one of the things that I would love to ask is that quote implies that people are not free. So there's some prison that they're living in. Yeah. So I'd love to know what are the fundamental prisons that people are living in from working with so many people? What have you found are the patterns that people are living in the, the, the prisons? Yeah. And also how can they reveal, actually, no, you, you already shared that in the quote, like people in circumstances will reveal that. So can you just expand on the, the fundamental prisons that people are living in? Yeah, sure. So, you know, again, there's a bunch, right? So I can't cover them all here. Um, I've delineated 10 that are primal to the subconscious that every human being has. And I'll be covering those in the book. Obviously we cover a ton of them in the mastermind. Um, so the most common one that people can relate to is the idea that there's something wrong with us or that we're not enough. And so that falls under the bigger umbrella of feeling inadequate some way. So <clears throat> I just want people, I sort of spoke to it or alluded to it earlier. If you're living in that world in your subconscious and it really is kind of like a space, then your thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and results are also in that container, right? So if mm. who you are for yourself is I'm not enough, then you can't help but be driven by that fundamental foundation, right? It's, it's literally the base of your identity. So you will have thoughts that are commensurate with I'm not enough. So it'd be like, you didn't get picked first for a team or you competed at something and didn't do so well. And so you berate yourself or your relationship fell apart and you think it's your fault, right? All of those confirm the idea that I'm not enough or you're not in a relationship and you can't find someone. Well, clearly it's because I'm not enough, right? So, and then the feelings that would come with that are like shame and embarrassment and loneliness and also as a compensation as i said earlier the people pleasing or the perfectionism is this adaptation it's maladaptive because 
it's not a healthy adaptation, but you're trying to compensate for not being enough. So that's where people can become exhausted. They can get adrenal fatigue, you know, because they're literally trying to give more, do more, work harder as a compensation for this deep belief that they're not enough. So that's what I help people to break out of. And it's, as you know, very liberating. <laughs> yeah, you're very, very great at that. So yeah. um, <laughs> awesome. Okay, so how about we get some questions? Maybe we'll answer two or three and then I have yeah. some personal questions that I'd love to ask you just about your life and sure. then after that, we'll um, exit out of here. So there's one question that I just saw that I feel like might be really great um, sure. from Matthew. I don't know if I can share this, but I'll just ask it. Yeah, I don't think I can share it on my ends. But the question is, what do you suggest when newly back into dating where there's two people who are di at different levels of communication and emotional intelligence? Hmm. That's a that's a great question. So you're just back into dating. It doesn't matter if you're, I guess, back into dating or not. You could be in a relatively long relationship. So different levels of communication and emotional intelligence. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, I like to bring humor. I mean, I guess the person, Matt, asking the question is the one who thinks he's, you know, a better communicator and more emotionally intelligent. Otherwise, <laughs> Because if you're not a good communicator and you've got the lower emotional intelligence, you're probably not aware of it, right? So, mm -hmm. so, so in that case, if you think, first of all, I don't imply the word superior is what he's feeling, but if you feel that you are perhaps the leader in the relationship, then the opportunity is to inspire the person to share your own knowledge and your experience. It's no different than, you know, if I go and play golf with someone who's never played before, I could say I'm a superior golfer, but well, then I share, I inspire, I help, I educate. Conversely, I for sure can play with golfers who are way better than me, and I hope they would do the same for me. So I think depending on the underlying, call it the connection of the relationship, the commitment of the relationship, if the connection is strong and the commitment is there, then the subtleties of their own programming become a little bit less significant. Now, will it impact their relationship day to day? Of course, but if you're really in love with somebody and you're committed to them, then you want the best for them. And that would mean use your better communication, use your better emotional intelligence to help them to raise theirs. So all, by, mm -hmm. all boats rise with the tide. So now if it becomes problematic, meaning if you start to feel you're judging the person, then obviously it's the absence of love that wouldn't be a good relationship to be in. You know, you're just sort of fluffing your own ego. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. I've never had that one. Love that. Um, one thing that I love is I've heard you share around, I've asked you questions about financial abundance. And yeah. one of the things that you said is, well, if you want the financial abundance to match the energy, which is just to feel abundant, right? Yes. And I feel like this can be helpful to anyone who is currently single right now, because a question I see here is how can I meet the man of my dreams? And said in a different way, other people might be, you know, how do I find a relationship? Or how do I get, how do I find the love of my life? So what yeah. would you say to, to that question right there? I mean, you are the love of your life. <laughs> Everybody else is just helping you find that. So, um, you know, again, it's like, it's celluloid, it's Hollywood, it's all the BS that gets fed to us through propaganda. And, you know, sometimes it's entertaining, fine. but. Um, there's no right one. That's just the biggest illusion that just sells a lot of red roses on Valentine's days and boxes of chocolates and makes a ton of love songs, right? And gets Tom Cruise saying, you complete me. Uh, God bless him. Um, I love him. I worked with him for five years, as you know. But um, yeah, so I think, you know, if people could just wake up and be a little bit more mature around love and realize that really what you're looking for is love, period. It's not love with someone. It's not love of someone love from someone it's just like you know your own experience of yourself which i say is love so then for sure you become more available to the experience of connecting with somebody in a loving union assuming they've done some work too but to think that the love is out there with someone that's never going to end well so how are they going to find that <laughs> Well, not me. Not I mean, maybe. You're going to find love with just me, baby. Just <laughs> yeah. I'm there just trying to hoard everybody for myself. <laughs> okay, next question. Um, how does one break the old habit or pattern of impulsive reacting to some conscious belief surfacing? Big question. 
Say again. So okay. how does someone stop the what the impulsive reaction? How does one break the old patterns of impulsive reacting to subconscious belief surfacing? Ah, uh, I mean, it would be better if they had a specific because you know when we get into concepts, it's very hard. Um, yeah. You know, breaking a pattern that is part of your subconscious, depending on how ingrained it is, there's so many factors. How old are you? How significant was the trauma that helped to stimulate that particular subconscious pattern? Because if it was a real trauma, then that reaction might still be appropriate because you're processing. If it was something pretty benign when you were a child that happened and you're still having a strong reaction, okay, then fine. We could say that's unnecessary, a little overreactive. Um, so it depends where you're at. Um, I always encourage people to be gentle with themselves. Uh, to be patient with the process. Subconscious patterns are very ingrained. Most people aren't looking at them until they're in their 30s or 40s. So you've got three or four decades uh, of practicing and, and conditioning. And then ideally find somebody who knows how to listen. So if they go back mm. and listen to this live to learn how to listen, then they can find someone who knows how to listen <laughs> so that somebody can hear where they're quote unquote, you know, stuck. So having a community of people around us, that's a safe space to speak into, to share your woes, to share how you feel is, um, that's priceless, you know? And some people, of course, maybe not have that. They have a great therapist or they'll have a great family member who can listen. Um, so really having a container of love and acceptance is another way to help mitigate or release some of that tightness around a subconscious constraint. Yes. I see one pattern that commonly comes up and you spoke about this in the mastermind and hearing this also helped me to navigate through life differently. You, you mentioned that um, love includes you. Yeah. Or caring for another includes you. Yeah. And I thought, I was looking at myself and just my past patterns and I was like, wow, that uh, some, there's time from time to time, there's decisions where love, I, I'm not including me first in that decision. Yeah. So um, can you just, before we ask, answer, answer a few more questions, can you expand on that quote right there? Yeah, I mean, that's an expanded view of love, right? It's a very, um, it's a very powerful um, distinction because most people, again, courtesy of Hollywood and all the rest, like we're under the impression that love, it is a verb, but it's like, it's really reinforced as something that we think we do to others, for others, or we feel for others. And so it becomes sort of this, again, this subtle divisive energy from self, meaning that not divisive in terms of like you're separating people out there, but like you're, you're, you're removing yourself from the essence of love because it's like, I love you. And that's fine and it's beautiful and love as many people as you can. Sure, we need more of that on the planet. But, um, you know, when I was teaching that in the group, it's about helping people understand that for the most part, human beings are pretty lousy in the way they're designed to be loving of self. Like how many times have we heard people say, Oh, love yourself or, you know, and it's like people struggle. They don't know what the hell that means or how to do it. Right. So it takes practice, but at least to understand that real love includes us and them. And when, when we, I, I did a podcast with um, Aubrey Marcus, I think it was my first one with him. And I said, I'm in love. Now, when people hear that expression, it usually connotates that there's someone out there that I'm in love with, right? Oh, wow, congratulations, who with? And I gave the, unpacked it with a deeper distinction. No, 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 I'm in the essence of love. I'm bathing in love, like I'm in air, right? And so I'm breathing just as uh, everybody else around me is. And when we're in the energy of love, when we're in the essence of love, then not only do I experience that for myself, but I afford it to others. So it's um, subtle, but powerful. Don't think that love is out there with someone or that you're in love with that person. If it becomes personified, then you're basically on a time release uh, to disappointment <laughs> and heartache, <Yeah>. right? <laughs> yeah, unless you happen to spend the rest of your life together until you both die. But if you both yeah. die at the same time, that's very rare. So you get the point. <laughs> and I think that... Um to ask the last question before I answer some, ask some questions here. Yeah. I think that this might be a great question to add on to what you've just shared, which is, I have an idea of what you're going to share here, but I'd love to ask it. How do yeah. we get more in the frequency of love? 
Ah, again, going back to what I said about like listening is there in the absence of, you know, the part of us that is trying to survive, you know, it, it's so subtle. But if you look about, if you look into the way you phrase the question, which is not wrong, it's beautiful, but how do I, or how do we get in the essence of love or more in love? It's like, there's love over here. And then there's little old me. How, how do I get, I want to go over here. Like, how, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were kind of nuts. Anyway, Austin Powers. Um, how do I get in love, baby? Um, so it implies separation again, right? So I assert that love is there. Like love is there, just like air and all the elements. And so really, if we're not experiencing love, we want to look at not how do I get into it, but how do I get out of the current perspective and energy that I have? And so as I drop the views of myself that are confined, constraining, limiting based on these inadequacies, insecurities I have about myself, as I release those, then I, that's the literal fall in love that's waiting there to receive us. But yeah. most people don't get that because they think that who they are is not enough and all the rest of it, as I said, all the diff different constraints that I talk about, certainly in the mastermind, it's like when you're in that world, you can't find love because you're in the world of survival and separation. Like they literally are two different things. Like it's like chalk and cheese or oil and water. Like if you're in, if you're in the energy of constraint, if you're in the energy of limitation, you can't find love because love is the absence of separation. <laughs> so you can't, so the question is, I get it, but how do I get into the essence of love? It's implying you're not in it and that's the lie. You are, there's just an illusory self. There's this identity that's founded in adequacies, constraints, that is the barrier to the love that, as I said, is waiting to receive you when you finally get over yourself. <laughs> Beautiful. Love that. Okay. So Danica. the last, yeah, the last uh, few questions that I have are more, there, there's some personal questions that I'd love to know. Is sure. that cool for you? Just personal questions? Yeah. I mean, how personal are we going to get here? I'm pretty open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I would love to know, like you've shared your story with, your parents and just your childhood and um it's really beautiful hearing just your experience with your mom and your dad and i would yeah. love to know if you're open to sharing um what were your biggest lessons from your mom and yeah. i'd also love to know what's the biggest lesson that you got from your dad growing up great questions wow you're good at this my man um <laughs> i think because i was only seven when my mom died so it's very difficult to mm. like understand what i what attributes i embodied by courtesy of my mom in hindsight looking back through you know obviously a far more evolved mind i could say in ways that i wasn't aware that i through osmosis took on kindness um unconditional love and perhaps um profound acceptance because she knew for a while she was dying of cancer and i can only imagine what that must be like for for anyone you know she was very young um like barely into her 40s early 40s so knowing she has a young boy who she adores as the only child so i got all of the love and attention from my folks and they were very loving so i can only imagine i like to like going back to the listening i really like to try and literally be in somebody else's view of life and i think what i got was how how much grace that woman had to show to know that she's going to die when she has a little boy and they, they had a miscarriage before me so there was already a bit of trauma around childhood or having a child um so i would say if there was anything that she kindly gifted me it was those values of unconditional love of grace, of patience, and profound acceptance because she knew her fate. And in fact, I don't share this often, she actually wrote a note to me uh, prior to her death that uh, I, it was in an envelope for me to open when I was 18. And it brought te tears to my eyes reading it, not just because of what she said to me, which was just exquisitely beautiful, because, but because I was imagining myself in her position writing that note to her son knowing that she would no longer be around for him so that's pretty profound my dad i mean again unconditional love he loved the 
you know, he thought the sun shone out of my rear. I mean, he, you know, he can, I couldn't do anything wrong occasionally, but he never, even then, he didn't really discipline me. He just educated me. Um, so, you know, my dad, unconditional love, patience. Um, he was very patient with me. And I would also say admiration. Like he just, as I said, he kind of revered me as a son. I was an incredibly talented soccer player and I, I know he cut out every piece of media or newspaper clippings from the local paper that I had ever done anything, you know, and kept everything on file. I was a very proud dad. Um, and I also think in a different way to my mom's acceptance, I would say his was courage, but it's a, I would say it's a bedfellow of acceptance, which is meaning not only had he quote unquote lost his wife, obviously we know we don't use that term, not because it's bad, but because it's not what happened. But for him, I'm assuming he would have felt the loss of his wife and the mother of his child. But even in the face of that, I don't know the guttural in fortitude, the intestinal fortitude he would have had to have to keep going. It was just him and I, and he still had to work. So there were a lot of times where he had to leave me with a, a nanny or a babysitter, and some of those experiences weren't great for me, I can tell you right now. <laughs> um, so he probably felt a lot of guilt about the fact that there wasn't someone with his son, that he had to work, he had to provide, we weren't wealthy. And at times, you know, he did the best he could to take care of me. So, yeah, wow. almost bringing me to tears, my man. <laughs> yeah. So much for sharing that. And like, there's so many beautiful comments coming through. I got goosebumps hearing about your story, about your mom and the letter. So really appreciate you sharing that you know sure. that's, um that's beautiful yeah. and i'd also love to know outside of your parents was there anyone who had a really big impact on your life outside of your parents and if so in what way did they have an impact damn great questions i might have needed a cheat sheet before this <laughs> um I, I mean i think you know there's a couple of people that come to mind who i never met because they were they had died uh, but like traditional gurus who I've spoken to a couple of times. Um, so Krishnamurti, who was sort of this traditional philosopher, Indian guru. He, I think he got based in Ojai, eventually came to California. And then he was the first person I read. I can remember, God, it was a long time ago. And it was the first book I read. And I was like, holy shit, like, I'm not a lunatic. Like somebody's sort of seeing the same things I'm seeing. <laughs> Cause I thought I was just a freak of nature for a minute, you know? And then, uh, then Srinas of Gadata, who's Maharaj Srinas of Gadata, who's another Indian guru. He was a much more, Krishnamurti kind of had an elegance about him. He was a beautiful man. And Krishna, um, Srinas of Gadata was much more like the tough love guy. And I have both. Like I obviously, as you've seen, even, coaching people in the mastermind, I can hold space. Some of the stories we heard were very powerful and traumatic, you know, and so I bring an absolute unconditional love and safety for that person. And then you've also seen me with people where I'm like, okay, you've got to pull your head out of your ass. There's nothing wrong with you. You know, it's sort of that tough, tough, direct love, like a laser. And so he kind of represented that. And um, so those two for sure, I'm trying to think in real life, because I've just been blessed with so many people that I've met. I mean, the girl that I dated, she was, you know, in a way that I don't think she understood was such a powerful lesson for me in terms of reconciling my fear of loss. I've been blessed with so many beautiful romantic relationships. Pretty much everybody I've ever been with has just been a beautiful soul. So they've all contributed to me. And, you know, without sounding too gushy, I, I, I'd like to say anybody that I have the ability or the, 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 the privilege to help coach, you know, yourself the hundreds of people in the mastermind like we had over 26 countries i think or something people represented it was incredible that to me is so humbling that people trust me they come into the space they wanted to learn they wanted to be part of a community so that changed my life too you know so i think without making it a catch-all umbrella like everybody really contributes to us right because even if it's someone you think pisses you off there's a beautiful lesson there so they become a great teacher so but they're the, they're the pivotal people, I would say. And if I think of someone else whilst we're chatting, I'll, I'll throw it in the basket. <laughs> awesome, please do. Yeah, beautiful answers. Um, and yeah, that's the reason why I'm going to be rejoining the mastermind. Because oh, nice. It's, it's, it was, yeah, I've already, already rejoined. And it's going to be... Double, yeah, double I dipping, I love it. That's awesome. Double dipping. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Can't um, get enough. This is the last, the last question, which is, what is your favorite thing about the mastermind? And also for anyone who is interested, can you share just a little bit about, um, about, about the mastermind, where to go and someone if they're interested in joining? Yeah, I mean, the favorite thing might be just what I alluded to, which is obviously the one that we just did was my first one. So I, look, I know the difference my work makes and I know what I have to share is so unique and powerful, but I didn't know how many people were going to show up. I didn't know if it was be like me and one person like, hey, how are you doing? I'm Peter, nice to meet you. Uh, as it turned out, there were like hundreds and it was incredible. Um, and it's that component, the group, like, you know, the fact that we have this app and the community where you all share, you all, I mean, shit, the number of little groups that everyone created off that, like we've got the terrible coaching group, which is hysterical. <laughs> you know, we, people are doing book readings. I think you were talking about how to develop the business of coaching. Like that is something I couldn't predict is how everybody came together and started to create this container that was of pure love and support for one another. So that for me was probably one of my favorite takeaways was just now I feel like I've got friends for life and uh, people like yourself, you know, I mean, we're actually entertaining maybe some people being part of our company now <laughs> who are in the mastermind because, you know, it's just like meeting incredible souls who are committed to doing the work. So, um, yeah, just and also, again, I think for myself, I really... The humility, like as I shared so often in the group, the, the humility I feel of how so many people are committed to show up because of who I am. Like that, that's not lost on me. You know, that's very flattering that people not only are committed to doing the work, they want to break free of their suffering and their problems and they want to have a successful, loving life. And that's beautiful, but they're trusting me, you know, and, and that feels really good. And I know... I know I got to deliver, so I feel good about it. <laughs> Absolutely. So if you are watching live, you can go to Peter's page. It's just link in your bio. Is that right? Yeah, they can. Yeah, if anyone's interested, for sure. Um, link yeah. in bio. There's only a couple of days left, but we'll, we'll share some more things on Instagram too. But like, yes, for anybody who is interested, that's great. Again, no worries yeah. if not. Um, but yeah, I'm excited. It just... Uh, it's definitely the most powerful thing I've shared in terms of my work. And it's the most powerful I have experienced because of the people like yourself who showed up. Yeah. And I think it's so powerful. Even, like there's for coaches, absolutely get in just, just seeing the way that you coach and then you breaking it down. It can, I feel like I've become a much better coach just by listening to the way that you do it and breaking it all down. But even if you're not a coach, just being yeah. able to have tools and resources and information to support yourself, I yeah. feel like is, really beneficial as well so yeah I highly recommend thank, thank you i mean there were definitely a lot of coaches but i think there was also you know i don't know the percentages but for sure the majority were people who just wanted to you know heal themselves overcome their history have more passionate relationships make more money be healthier you know like and then some who literally became coaches or are starting coaching businesses because they were so inspired and they wanted to leave their own job. And so that's also cool. But yeah, it's, as long as you're human, you know, I've yet to meet a human being who doesn't have something in the way of their own incredible um, potential, you know, and to be able to access that with more freedom, more power, more self-worth. Like, I don't care what you do, you're going to do it better with more joy. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And for those of you watching on YouTube, I'll put it down below. For those of you watching live right now, I'll be reposting it on YouTube and like editing it up so you can rewatch this if you desire. And um, just want to say thank you so much, brother. It's been um, really yeah. great having you. No, pleasure. We, we have time. If there's one more question, I'm happy to answer anything that you see oh, float go. by. One more question. Yeah, let's right. go. Any other questions, go ahead and write it in the uh, comment section. We'd love to answer any more questions that you have. Or if and you I had another support. person, well, you have some damn good questions. You almost had me in tears at one point. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, okay, I have another question here. Oh, I think this might be great. Oh. Any comment on okay, let's just go for this one. So there's a question from Annie here. She mentioned that um, I've been told by men that I have a wall and am unapproachable. So being confident and certain in the way I speak makes me unapproachable with a question mark. So read it again. I really want to feel the energy of it. So she has a wall. So, so I've been told by men that I have a wall and am unapproachable. So the question is like, so being confident and certain in the way that I speak makes me unapproachable with a question mark. Oh, okay. So she's asking if that's what's creating the, the energy of unapproachable. Um, so first of all, she's, 
you know, we've got to be careful with language. Men saying she's unapproachable isn't true. How do I know that? Because clearly somebody's approached her to tell her that she's unapproachable. <laughs> you know me, I'm just, I'm just going to break it down and throw it a little bit of a slap. Like, so you are approachable, even if it's only for people to come up to you to tell you that you're unapproachable, <laughs> at which point it falls flat on its face. So what I hear is a couple of things. One, yeah, there might be something about you that you're not quite so available. Maybe there's a part of you that's shy. Maybe there's a part of you that you're very self-conscious. But I don't know, you might be like a, just a stunning woman or maybe you're brilliant or you're stylish and perhaps men feel intimidated around you and that's their interpretation of your unapproachability, right? Like mm. I know from girlfriends that I've either known as friends or, you know, sometimes really beautiful women feel they're unapproachable, but it's not so much they're unapproachable, it's just most guys are too insecure to go up to what they consider to be a beautiful woman. So that may be going on. Um, but yeah, so don't take what people say too personally. First of all, it's just their opinion, as I was saying earlier, if you learn to listen. But if you also learn to listen, there may be something to learn, right? So, oh, okay, that's interesting. You think I'm unapproachable. So what is it about me in terms of my vibration, my resonance, that I'm, quote, unquote, putting off? Because we're all receivers and transmitters at the same time, right? That's the energy of attraction. So perhaps her transmission has got a little bit of that undercurrent of don't come too close. Maybe she feels that she isn't safe. Maybe she's had some past relationships with men that didn't go well. Perhaps she was hurt, whether it be emotionally, you know, God forbid, physically. And so that has created a little bit more of a vigilance that she has, like where she doesn't want to be hurt again, which would be human. But that energy is a little defensive. Think about a dog that's been hit too many times. It's eventually going to growl and bite the shit out of you because it's like, okay, I just don't want more hands coming near me because that's what's hurt in my history. So unapproachability, it's got two parts to it, right? It's the interpretation of what she thinks they're saying, and then it's her own experience of herself. So I would invite somebody who feels that is look at yourself and see if you can find out where do you feel unapproachable for yourself, meaning what aspects of you don't you like? What aspects of you are you not enamored by? What aspects of you do you dismiss? You know, you don't like your hips, you don't like your cheekbones, you don't like your intelligence, you don't like your income. You know, that energy is equally unapproachable because you're denying aspects of yourself. So I hope that helps. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's actually really great. And um, I'll share what she just shared in the comments, but I saw that on your story, you said, something along the lines of if you don't like what you see in the mirror look through new eyes yes you said something along the lines right yeah 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 and he just shared i'm in tears right now thank you by the way annie for that beautiful you know question i just fell in love with you peter there we go well there you go There's i'm one. clearly very approachable <laughs> <laughs> through a phone and if annie is so hot that guys are scared to then i'll consider it i mean the, the, <laughs> you know <laughs> I saw someone else. I saw someone else. Uh, you can add this to your list. Was, I, I forgot who said it, but like, someone said that you're a combination of Austin Powers, Buddha, and Einstein. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a journalist in the UK. Yes. Well, someone else just said you're the second coming of Jesus. I saw that earlier. Ooh. So you can add that to the list. <laughs> no pressure there, then. <laughs> the second no coming of Jesus. You know, there's a very powerful story. I don't know if it's appropriate now, but anyway. Yeah, somebody said that he was in my suite of spirit guides, which yes. is pretty insane. Like I went to see a medium and she went white when she said it. She's like, I've only seen this twice in my history. And she'd been um, doing it like she was like 60 something. She'd been there for 40 years. So I don't know. I mean, it's certainly nice to hear. I certainly yeah. have a lot of respect for the dude and I try as best as I can to embody um, his consciousness his love his acceptance his healing powers i don't have quite the healing power of touch maybe uh, in different ways but no anyway listen that's uh, that's a little big for me to take on but it's very kind of whoever said that and um i think you know we would all do well to try and embody some of those qualities especially in this day and age i'd certainly love to be able to walk on water that'd be pretty sick but the fact that i that think be. it would be pretty sick is probably my ego so that's why i'm screwed <laughs> <laughs> yes um well thank you so much there are some questions here for the mastermind so 
if they have any questions, do they just reach out to any of the team or? Yeah, they can, they can go on the website and send a message to support at petercrone.com or if you just go on to the website, there's the mastermind link itself. So um, yeah, no, I mean, it's awesome. Look, you know, I love obviously the more people the merrier and the, the better the community, but hopefully, I mean, shit, you asked some great questions. I think I dropped a few mics hopefully and uh, hopefully people are yeah. for the better of it right now. Yes, thank you so much. And for anyone who's watching live, if you had any takeaways, any breakthroughs from this, I would love to uh, see on your story. If you have anything that you want to write up or post on there, yeah, Peter, um, love to see any of your any of your takeaways from this live. Um, so, again, brother, just want to say thank you so much. It was yeah. an honor to have you. Just, much you love. So much. Great to Always. converse, and I'm excited that I'll see you uh, on Saturday, starting this Saturday. <laughs> So I really hope that this video helped you out. You can see links to Peter's mastermind down below, all of his social media channels. So go and check him out, go and check the mastermind out. And if it resonates and aligns, highly recommend joining it. And you'll see all the links to my socials down below as well. But with that said, I would love to know your biggest takeaway from this interview. Leave it down below. I read every single comment and I would love to hear it. And I'm sure Peter would love to see it as well.